I wonder how you are this morning. I wonder how your circumstances are. And even how, what kind of a start has this day got off to? As we worship together this morning, we'll uh, be encountering the disciples on the beach. They've actually gone fishing. They didn't realise that Jesus was there all the time, ready, waiting. He'd even prepared a barbecue feast for them. And as they realise, they delight. Jesus is here. It's as though that revelation needs to dawn on them. They need to see beyond the circumstances. A curtain, if you like, needs to go up and they need to see the reality that Jesus is present with them and he's been waiting. As we open in worship and prayer this morning, can we take hold of that reality? That God is waiting, he's ready to receive our worship, to enjoy our presence and bless us. Welcome to today's online service with St Francis. Let's worship. You never stop, you never 
never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Behind me, as you can see, um, there's been some ivy making its way up the wall that I uh, did my best to, to take off and try and get it under control. Is that uh, something that might help us think about uh, things that encroach on our lives uh, that we don't want to have hold on us as we come to confession? I can assure you that God does a much better job than I did at the ivy on the wall. But it's a good visual, isn't it? How sometimes uh, we can let behaviors and hurts, things that have happened to us, things that we've neglected, just get on top of us. And confession is perhaps a quite a traditional, old fashioned will, word, but it's a beautiful, beautiful contemporary practice of just having a really on, honest conversation with God and as often as possible. As we come to confession together, perhaps there's a picture you want to hold in mind of something that you would like to be free of. You might want to pause the clip, spend some time with God. When you're ready, let's bring all those things to God and confess together. We're often slow to follow the example of Christ. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We often fail to be known as Christ's disciples. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. We often fail to walk the way of the cross. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And the absolution. The Lord enrich us with his grace and nourish us with his blessing. The Lord defend us in trouble and keep us free from all evil. The Lord accept our prayers and absolve us from our differences and our offences. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. And the collect for today Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace to the glory of God the Father. Amen.
taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and he jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord. You know that I love you, Jesus said to him. Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This scripture that we're looking at today is so rich, there's so much that we could explore, but we're going to focus on the conversation between Jesus and Peter. The context of that is that they are on the shoreline, they have met with and recognised the risen Lord Jesus. He's been on the beach all this time, he's already got fish, he instructs them after a night of uh, fruitless uh, fishing, he instructs them to cast the net over the other side and so they haul in another miraculous catch. They'd have recognised that sign, who he was, and they've had this time with him, this encounter, this time of that's not recorded in detail of eating and spending time with him. And yet we have the detailed conversation, which feels like it's almost spotlighted uh, by John, the conversation between Jesus and Peter. And we're going to focus on that too. I think Peter would have said before this point that he knew who he was. He would have described himself, perhaps as we would have described him, as a, a bold adventurer, certainly before the point at lo of losing Jesus in the crucifixion, before this point of re-encounter, he would have described himself as a follower, all out for God, passionate, and we can see that uh, passion and that boldness in so many of the gospel narratives in terms of seeing Peter as a real man of action and a real man of faith. Indeed, he's boldly declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Really feel for Peter because uh, all the other disciples, the, the other scriptures make clear, declared very similar things at the same time. They all make uh, similar uh, de declarations and are of one mind that they won't desert Jesus. And yet, of course, in different ways they do on that night. We only have the record of Peter following Jesus on the night of his arrest, staying close to him that night, um, hiding in the courtyard. We only have his story in detail, watching as Jesus's torture and trial unfolded. We can assume that Peter himself probably narrowly avoided punishment or torture for being a Christ follower because he denied Christ. Just as Jesus had predicted he would three times and even before the cock crowed that night or that very day. And we assume then he ran away to safety. But what had he lost in all of that transaction? So we have this conversation with the risen Lord Jesus between Simon Peter and Jesus. Who is saying what is one of my questions. Why the repetition of the question, do you love me? And Peter's response, where is it happening and is that significant? Well, Jesus addresses Peter as Simon, son of John, uh, not Peter, which would have meant the rock and which he'd called him before. What's being unsaid here and what is being said? What are we to understand from this dialogue? The question is asked three times. Is that significant? Peter replies three times. Is that significant? At first glance, glance, Jesus doesn't seem to hear this declaration from Peter, uh, saying only tend my sheep or feed my sheep or my lamb in one of the sentences. It doesn't seem to quite hang together, this dialogue. It's almost like there are things that are unsaid or, or haven't been spoken out loud that are happening. Uh, we, we're left feeling a little confused or uncomfortable with quite how the conversation fits together. Let's explore that and see if we can understand and make sense of it. Where is it happening? Well, we, let's deal with that question first. This is a witness conversation. Scholars tend to agree that uh, the other disciples are, are close by and they either see or overhear or are part of this conversation. Possibly it was one of those awkward conversations where something comes to light and you are really hoping no one is listening and yet everyone is listening. Perhaps it was impossible not to overhear, or perhaps it was later discussed in more detail. Whatever happened or however it happened, the frame I'd like us to look at this scripture and the frame I want to offer is visible mending. Someone introduced me to this recently. I'm very excited by the, the idea of it as, a, uh, as an eco practice, as something uh, where we can restore and mend things and make use of them again, repurpose them.
But in this context, in the passage, I think it's a really good lens to unpack some of the things that's happening between Jesus and Peter and what Jesus is doing in Peter's life in this particular conversation and this season. The visible mending is when something is repaired and restored to its full purpose, but differently. So we might take a sock that's got a great hole in it, we might darn it, and we could mend it or restore it just to its former self. That would be invisible mending. We could make sure that the repair work was as good as it could be and it, it wasn't easy to see that we'd patched it up. Or we could visibly mend it. So visible mending is where it's restored not to its former glory, but to a fuller glory. And something is made different and better all at the same time, visibly so. It's distinctively repaired with a design or a pattern or a flourish or a colour. And so you can't help but see that it's been mended, but it's become even more beautiful. Visible mending. Wonderfully, we might say that at this point where we, Jesus is talking to Peter, that he's perhaps a failure to some extent in the world's eyes or his own. Um, this is the Peter that knew he hadn't protected Jesus. He thought he would, he thought he could, and he hadn't. He thought he would have been faithful to Jesus, and of course he, he wasn't. He couldn't on that night. He and his followers, uh, Jesus' followers, are in hiding of sorts now, certainly avoiding certain groups, trying to stay safe, and they've lived life openly and, and loudly and beautifully following Jesus. Crowds have followed Jesus up to this point and they've been part of that incredible, miraculous story. And now they don't even know what's happening. They hadn't understood all along, even after three years of residential training, there's still so much that they, they're not getting and that feels so difficult. Peter is clearly enthralled to see Jesus. He, On the resurrection day, he runs to the tomb at the news. Here in this particular passage, he leaps out of the boat, having realised because someone's recognised Jesus on the shore. But surely, even though he loves him, he's carrying the weight of his personal dreams, seemingly in tatters. There's such a complex mix of things going on in Peter's life at this point. I say wonderfully a failure in his own or the world's eyes, because in Jesus' reverse economy, in this kingdom economy, I think Jesus is seeing Peter as excellent leadership material at this point. There is visible mending underway. I said we'd look at uh, the who and the what and the why. Let's do that. Who? Well, Jesus addresses Simon, son of John. That's the language he uses. Is that because he's being a bit formal? Um, is this a rebuke of such? Is the distance between them? Is, it, is the tone cool? I think we could say those things, but I don't think that's the... the right way to read the passage. I don't think that's the tone of the conversation that they're having. We can't know for sure, but it, it just seems significant that he chooses that name. His name was Simon, and it's Jesus that called him Peter, or Rock, Cephas, Simon Peter, he's often referred to. Is Jesus here taking Simon right back to the beginning? That he's making it clear that, or could we read it as, Peter was never a replacement identity for him. It was a calling, it was a purpose of Simon, Simon Peter. Is Jesus saying, I always chose you, I still choose you. I know you better than you know yourself and your limits better than you know. I know the person you are and have been and are becoming because I've purposed you, Simon, son of John, to become Simon Peter. There is visible mending here. Why this conversation? Why the repetition within it though? Why is it happening? Jesus asked the question, do you love me? Three times. I'd say that again, this was visible mending insofar as it's in front of the others. Peter replies each time, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he finds it painful the third time. The scripture is quite clear that that's the reason that he's in pain at this point, because Jesus keeps asking, and he's asked for a third time. Is there a sense that Jesus is tenderly, kindly walking Simon back through that night of the arrest, back through who Peter believed he was at that time? 
back through the denial, back through the shame of it, the excruciating pain of letting Jesus down in his Peter's own eyes. And now every sentence between them is it pregnant with healing balm and possibilities to which Simon, Simon Peter, is able to say, yes, Lord, I love you. You know that I love you. I don't think this is a test. I think it's a testimony from Peter. Jesus asks because, not because Jesus needs to know, he knows already what's in Peter's heart, but because Simon Peter needs to hear himself say these words to Jesus. This is visible mending in the way. It's visible to Peter too. Why doesn't Jesus then accept Peter's declaration? If he knows that he loves him already, why doesn't he um, affirm that and say, I, I'm so glad you said that, I knew that. We don't get that in this conversation. He gives this um, quite a, a specific response, tend my sheep or feed my sheep, lamb, in one of the sentences. Is Jesus listening to Peter? Is there something else going on here? Of course, I believe that Jesus is really tuned in and does know what's happening in the conversation. He spoke of himself as the true shepherd. He's the shepherd of Ezekiel, the only one shepherd who really can and will tend the sheep well. He won't leave the flock. He won't let them down. He's different to the shepherds described in Ezekiel who oppress and use the flock for their own gains. Jesus, the true shepherd, is appointing here his first deputy, or under shepherd who will train other shepherds and other disciples to tend and to bless and to encourage and protect. Simon Peter will lead others on fishing trips in the future, but they will all be fishers of men and women and children, finding and tending to the lost, the broken and the hurt, the injured sheep. Again, visible mending to a purpose made new again, made differently better. He's affirming that I trust you, Simon Peter, with my most precious possession, my people, and in me, you can do this job. The conversation ends wonderfully as well. If you're familiar with the words, um, or you remember the words that it closes with, um, you, you may have a question about that because actually he, Jesus is talking about the end of Peter's life and he's talking about the suffering he will endure. But I still think it's wonderful. Jesus here isn't instilling fear into Peter. He's affirming him. He is saying, Peter, I know how your story ends, your life story. We understand that Jesus uh, knew that Peter was to be put to death on the cross. But this isn't a warning it's not something that can or will be avoided, is the ultimate affirmation. Jesus is saying, the faithfulness you declared so confidently and boldly and then couldn't follow through, that three times denial. Well, in your old age, at your weakest and most vulnerable, you won't deny me. I've always known you better than you know yourself. The person you hoped you were and you were afraid that you've let down perhaps or me, or yourself. I, Jesus, will lead you and grow you into that person. It's almost like perhaps Peter glimpsed his in his naivety, um, in his perhaps vanity, or broken ambition early on in his life when he met Jesus, something of the rock that Jesus had purposed him to be. But perhaps Peter was wanting to run before he could walk, and he lead needs to learn to walk at Jesus' pace. Jesus is saying here, Simon, son of John, this is just the beginning. Peter, only I can complete the work in you. You need to allow me to do it. It's my plan, my purpose and my sheep. Stay close to me, watch and learn. He closes, having affirmed Peter, pro prophesied over his future. He closes with the words simply, follow me. Let's pause to reflect on some of the themes in today's scripture. You might want to use the image that's on the screen. It's actually my alb, um, some of the robes we uh, occasionally use for ceremonies. 
I bought it secondhand, wanting to reuse something, to bring something back into, into use. And when I did that, I knew it had an orange stain on the hood. Someone kindly offered to embroider something over it. So you'll see three crosses. The central one being Jesus's cross. Which makes the stain fade into the background. There's the two crosses either side. The crosses of the thieves who were crucified either side of him and one of whom has a conversation that concludes with Jesus telling him, today, you will be with me in paradise. It's an image of restoration, of divine encounter that changes everything in the most unlikely of places. Let's pray. Holy Spirit. Would you help us to experience your presence with us now? Help us to receive from you right now here in our rooms. Would you refresh us, good Lord? Would you renew us, Holy Spirit? Would you restore us? And in the places and pockets of our lives, and persons that perhaps we are too fearful to name sometimes, or perhaps have yet to really face in ourselves. We ask that you would be divinely at work. To bring all things into right alignment. to heal, to recover and renew. That every area of our lives and characters, our hearts and our minds, would be filled with love for you. Readied for your purpose. made even more alive with your possibilities and your hopes for ourselves and others. May we see an increase of your reign, your kingdom's reign in our lives and others, good Lord. We invite you to do the work in us, to ready us, to serve you, to be more available to you. And we trust that you speak always goodness and blessing healing and wisdom over us. We receive all that you have for us, Holy Spirit.
I really like this period between Easter and Pentecost when we celebrate that first resurrection day and we travel towards, alongside the disciples stories, towards and then celebrate Pentecost, the day when the Holy Spirit came and empowered and equipped the disciples for the work that they were to do. I love the in-between bit, when they're still working things out, they're still they have faith, but they're still trying to understand. There's so much to consider, and yet the beauty of their experience is undeniable. They have so many questions, and yet the reality of God has impacted their lives forever. I think it's really beautiful to be witness to their stories, their personal lives and testimonies. Let's bear that in mind as we declare our own faith. Seek to understand God more. Give him our questions, but praise him using the gift of the faith he's given us and will grow in us too. Let's say together. Do we believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him? Do we believe and trust in God the Son, who died, who took our human nature, died for us, rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do we believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? We believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Creator God, you have generously blessed us with an abundance of gifts in this your world. Help us to share in that generosity by living in a way that ensures that your gifts will continue to be available for future generations. Lord, hear us. O oh God, give us your love for the whole of creation. Creator God, we rejoice that, as human beings, we have been created in your image and likeness. We also recognise that humanity alone cannot adequately reflect you. The whole diversity of the earth is needed to give us an, even a glimpse of your wonder and greatness. Help us to live in a sustainable way so that this marvellous diversity is respected. O oh God, give us your love for the whole of creation. Creator God, we live in a world where some of us throw out food while others go to bed hungry. Where some have modern amenities of life at their disposal and others struggle to find drinking water. May we learn to share with one another and, in this way, come to share in your generosity to all. O oh God, give us your love for the whole of creation. Creator God, the sun, the wind and the waves are your gift for the flourishing of the whole community of life on earth. Help us to use them creatively to produce sustainable energy for all. O oh God, give us your love for the whole of creation. Through scientists, engineers and scholars, new knowledge comes to light. May new developments in the production of sustainable energy project, protect our fragile planet and promote the well-being of all peoples and all creatures on their journey to wholeness. O oh God, give us your love for the whole of creation. We pray for the United Nations, for all international, national and local leaders, and for managers of companies, that they may be guided by your spirit to make wise decisions about sources of sustainable energy for all. O oh God, 
Give us your love for the whole of creation. Creator God, you have blessed humankind with understanding, imagination and memory. Show us how to learn from past mistakes and plan for the future creatively and responsibly. A prayer for our earth. All powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O oh God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognise that we are profoundly united with every creature. As we journey towards your infinite light, we thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love and peace. Amen. How have the themes in today's service impacted you? Has Jesus uh, tapped you on the shoulder as you've encountered him and stirred any questions, asked you anything? Is there something you want to ask him? What is our Lord God speaking over you in affirmation and confirmation to bless you, to heal you, to protect you and guide you in the future? I'd encourage you to spend time with him this week, especially if you sense that there's something that has challenged or encouraged or disconcerted you. He can lead us and will lead us through all of those things, right to the journey's end and to the blessing that awaits as we put our hand in his and trust him. With that in mind, let's pledge to continue our worship as we seek to follow him throughout the week ahead and close together with the blessing. Christ the Good Shepherd, who laid down his life for his sheep, draw us and all who hear his voice to be one flock within one fold. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us now, remain with us now and always. Amen. Have a beautiful blessed week.